by way of introduction, I'm going to be speaking with Maysoon Pachachi, a filmmaker, Iraqi, um, the British Iraqi living in London, um, who uh, directed and co-wrote co and um, produced the film um, that we watched this evening, Our River, Our Sky. So I'm so delighted to have this conversation with you about your beautiful and important film, Our River, Our Sky. Um, and I wanted to begin by putting the film into just a little bit of context. So as we're well aware, 20 years ago on March 19th, the United States led multinational forces invaded Iraq. And this was a politically calculated decision to use firepower of the most powerful militaries in the world to forcibly remove Saddam Hussein from power. President George Bush and his cronies made promises to deliver democracy to Iraq as if Iraqi people themselves should have nothing to do with the political change. A new regime was imposed on Iraq by the Coalition Provisional Authority, led by Paul Bremer, and an American diplomat and the architect of the devastating debathification policies in Iraq. All of this resulted in a political order based on sectarian quotas and the occupation of Iraq, creating and enabling horrendous forms of violence against the Iraqi people. Amidst all of this, Amidst all of the death and the devastation, of course, Iraqis have been living and enduring and making decisions about what comes next. Maysoon, you have been making documentaries about people living their lives under extraordinary circumstances for 30 years. You've made films in Palestine, Egypt, and Iran, but most recently your films have centered on Iraq, where your family comes from. And you've directed and produced three documentaries Iraqi Women Voices from Exile, Return to the Land of Wonders, and Open Shutters, Our Feelings Took the Pictures. And you co-founded the Independent Film and Television College, a free of charge film training center in Baghdad in 2004. So with this incredible um, wealth of experience and dedication to telling stories, uh, this is your first narrative film. And after a well-established career as a documentary filmmaker, I would love to hear how and where this fictional project about ordinary people living in Baghdad began for you. As part of a, a women's uh, group in in, uh, in London, made up of Iraqi women living here or, and non-Iraqi women. And we uh, called ACT Together. And uh, we were campaigning against sanctions very brutal sanctions for 13 years and and um, against the war and we were very much in contact with people in Iraq at that time and in women's groups and uh, and otherwise and also the film school that um I founded film training center really with um with my colleague uh Hassan Abed who's another uh, London-based Iraqi filmmaker um we were in touch, very much in touch with these students and what was going on in their lives. And um, so I was collecting stories, which is a sort of obsession and um, and uh, sort of talking to people and then hearing and seeing the pictures of what was actually going on, the kind of uh, the explosions, the, the killing of people, the corpses in the street, I mean, hideous stuff. And I thought, how are people living with this? I mean. How is this possible? Irada, my co-writer, um, who I met on the Open Shutters um, project, um, was she was a writer who was not able to write. The, the Sarah character is kind of based on her, I know. And uh, she, uh, all she could do was kind of make notes as she was going around about her business on a mm -hmm. daily night, you know, in the grocery store, taking her daughter to school, all this kind of stuff she would overhear um, little scenes happening or see them, you know, discussions between people. She just wrote everything down. And I did a similar thing, but from a distance, from the, the stories I was hearing from the students and, and the women that they were talking to and so on. So from that, we started to sort of generate the characters. Mm. And, um, yeah, and then, and, then we're, and then we're off. <laughs> So that's that's how it happened, you know. That's that's how it happened. I was, you know, I was worried about doing a fiction film because I knew that it was a much first for start. There's a lot a lot more bureaucracy and fundraising issues and all this sort of business. And I had been just shooting stuff myself, 
and doing everything on, on mm-hmm. film for quite a while. So suddenly I was going to have this whole kind of structure I was going to have to deal with and and could I do it? And this was part of the, pro- the problem in raising the money. It was like, you're a documentary filmmaker. What do you know about actors? Mm. And um, I thought, well, it's true, but I think I can do this. So it was a, it was a, yeah, it was a sort of leap in the dark, really. Yeah. So are there um, specific ways, strengths that you took from your experience in documentary that you think informed your approach to writing and directing this film? I think the biggest, the biggest influence in terms of my documentary filmmaking is that this is a collective story. And most of the document and all the documentary films I've made are basically a collective story. I've never made uh, a documentary about a singular person, mm. um, to, yeah, you know, and then the, the whole story was about them. It doesn't interest me somehow. I'm interested in groups of people. And mm. it's, I mean, I think we've talked about this before, but it's like, you know, living in the city, I'm very aware of everybody around me sitting on a bus. There's like a lot of parallel stories going on. And um, that, I mean, the fact that you could tell parallel stories is something that I discovered in film quite early. And I thought, I can do this. And because this is, that was sort of how my brain works for some reason. You know, it's sort of, while this is going on, that's going on there. And what is the relationship between these things? Um, So in a way, my documentary films are all a bit like that. And so that impacted on this film. Um, but the fact that it was a collective story um, was came from my documentary work. And I think also that um, I started to have a kind of um, disinterest in telling, in telling uh, you know, a central story with a central character um, around which you might get this like, decorative other pieces of other people's lives. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just, it was a hierarchy that I really didn't like. I, I, I realized it's quite late in my life. I actually don't, I mean, I love it when somebody does it well and I go to the cinema and watch it, but I don't know how to do it. And I'm not interested in doing it. Mm-hmm. And Irada was of the same, I mean, Irada thought the same thing. So we were, that's what we did. <laughs> yeah. I love the image of, you know, when you ride a bus through the city and you sort of yeah. get a picture of, of the city through the sort of the coming together of people. And of course, there's a very memorable scene in, in your film um, where people are on a bus together yeah. uh, in a in a difficult <laughs> scenario. Yeah. Um, and and I think um, looking at looking at a city in the context of um, the occupation um, presents a very specific lens on how we look at urban life, right? And I think um, because your film takes place in a very specific time and place in Baghdad in 2006, um, we're getting uh, a a view um, of people living their lives separately, but also in a shared set of circumstances. And I'm I'm curious, how you selected the perfect, precise frame for the film in terms of its setting and the time time frame for the film. You mean 2006? 2006, the end of 2006. End of 2006. Film. Well, in two, you know, um, at the, they were never in Iraq before, but once the invasion happened, then we got Al-Qaeda in Iraq, mm-hmm. which was um, led by a, a truly vicious, you know, person, sectarian. And um, so they were planting, um, ex- you know, they were planting bombs, explosions, IEDs, mm-hmm. and people were getting, and there was no logic to it. You know, you would, you would uh, get a bomb in a place, you think, well, why did he bomb a grocery store? So in early that, earlier that year, in 2006, a very important um, Shia shrine was mm-hmm. uh, exploded, um, was, was bom- um, blown up. Uh, by Al Qaeda in Iraq, and that was in Samarra, and it was like a touch paper. It ignited this this civil war, which is what it was meant to do. Mm-hmm. And the the kind of violence that was perpetrated by um, people was often really barbaric stuff, you know, quite. And 
you know, people were looking at themselves in the mirror thinking, is this us? This is us? Um, and what was happening during that time was that, um, you know, Iraq was a very pluralist society. And actually, you know, there was Shia and Sunni and, and Christians and Jews and all kinds of people there. But there were, um, you know, there are many families, for example, in, in Baghdad that were mixed. You know, they were the parents were of two different and it wasn't it wasn't a big deal, you know, it wasn't a, a problem. And it was and suddenly um neighborhoods became either this or that, and there were um concrete walls put around neighborhoods. And um, you know, so you got completely insane situations like a family, like one of the actors in the film, for example, he's one sect and his um, wife was another sect and they had two children and they couldn't live in the same place they couldn't you know they couldn't live in the same place because you couldn't have a mixture of people and so eventually they left the country um, to sweden and so it was it was that sort of crazy so that's why 2006 and i just thought to myself how are people living with this what is what is going on here what is it's it's like you, the, the sense you got from pe talking to people is that the world outside them and inside them is shattering. It's like a mirror, like holding a mirror, and it falls from your hands and it falls it, and it and it breaks into you know a thousand pieces or however many. Mm -hmm. If you can stick it back together again and you haven't lost any pieces, you can recreate the shape of the mirror round, say, but it's fractured, and that's an, in a way what my film is like that broken shattered mirror because all the stories are like shards basically mm. but they add up to a mirror the, the the actors in your film they're all iraqi which i know is a very deliberate choice and I'm, I'm wondering why this was important to you and um what challenges and opportunities came out of um your casting decisions well first of all not everybody was iraqi I not mean, everyone Sarah is Lebanese, for example. Okay. I mean, we had to sort of really grill her to, to learn the Iraqi accent because it's quite different. Wow, impressive. And at times it slips, you know, but it's sort of... And um, the woman who plays uh, Tamara, the girl, the woman who sews in her in her bedroom mm -hmm. each pocket and everything like that, she's Syrian. She was actually the wardrobe mistress. And the person that was supposed to play that role was a young uh, young woman who lived in Baghdad who I'd cast for it. It was a heavy metal guitarist. Uh -huh. And when and when the day came for her to come up to Slemani where we were shooting, um, to do her part, her mother phoned up and said, I'm sorry, she can't come. And I mm. said, What? She no, what's happening? You know, and she said, No, but we just have a situation here and there's nothing I can do about it. I'm sorry. So uh, which I I read to mean, I mean, her dad or her uncle or somebody didn't like the idea of her going off with a bunch of strangers, mm. film set, you know, or something like that. So anyway, she didn't come, but we really needed somebody. And we were in Kurdistan and there weren't a lot of people speaking Arabic and people who had the Arabs who had come to Kurdistan. I did auditions with them and it was just, it was hopeless. There was nobody that I found. So the wardrobe mistress... This, this girl said, um, I, d I, I know this woman. I know her. I know her. I've gone through this myself. I'm from Syria. I know what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And I can do this. And I said to her, have you ever acted before? She said, just a little bit, you know. And she read a scene and thought, well, okay. But we didn't have any choice. So things like that. Happened. So she was Syrian. So we had to add that line about, you know, you've been here so long and you still talk with a Syrian accent. Mm. That's what that was about. Wow. Uh, the rest of the actors were Iraqi, yes. And some of them were from the diaspora. I mean, um, somebody came from here, somebody came from Sweden. Uh, two people came from Germany, mm -hmm. um, those people. And then other people were there, absolutely there. I mean, the um, the young uh, boy who played Haider, um, who sleepwalks and stuff, mm -hmm. he was 15. And um, I had cast somebody else and they suddenly couldn't do it. And he came and I just, I went with it, you know. And um, what I really wanted to do was to give the opportunity to young actors in particular mm -hmm. to be in a film that was an international co-production that, you know, might be seen um, outside of, of the Middle East as well. Um, but it well, was, it, and, and the actors 
were, I mean, some were professionals. I mean, most of them were professionals, but there were quite a lot that were not. Mm -hmm. um, like the people smuggler wasn't the guy in the car in the rain and all that. He's never acted before in his life. And, wow. um, some of the people at the checkpoints and, you know, there were all sorts of people involved. In and I, I liked that. I mean, I liked that it was, uh, and that they were, they were Iraqis. I mean, they'd lived through this stuff. So they knew it. You know, it's sort of, that's the other thing. Um, and it was a chance. I mean, and when I showed the film in, in Baghdad last year, they all came to the uh, screening at, uh, in a mall, you know, big Dolby sound, you know, cinescope, everything. Like, everybody was really, really leaping up. They were so happy. They were going, did they see it? Did they see it in, in, in London? I said, yes, they said it. So it was, I was very happy that I did that. You know, it's, uh, that, uh, yeah, I concentrated on, on Iraqi actors because now, now in Iraq, there's a sort of, the beginning of what feels like a, a really a proper cinema culture happening. People are making films. Mm. Um, at that time, they weren't really quite yet. So I think there's a lot more chance for actors now than there have been. That's great. And I, I mean, I know um, people came from everywhere uh, on set, came together, the actors, and also I know your your crew. I know it was a multilingual environment and a lot of different um, people from different backgrounds coming together. Can you talk a little bit about what the set was like? Yeah, the set was, uh, our DOP was uh, British, spoke English, but his camera crew spoke um, Kurdish and Farsi. Mm -hmm. And his lighting crew spoke only Arabic. <laughs> and the sound department was French. So it was like we had five different languages on this on this crew. And somehow it worked. It was like magic. There was a way, I mean, the DOP in particular, Jonathan was brilliant. I mean, he was, uh, he's worked in all kinds of really difficult places around the world. And he's just very open person. And uh, I don't know, the language didn't seem to get in the way. And uh, mm -hmm. there were different ways of working and all of this kind of thing. And it was... Uh, it was amazing, and it was something I really enjoyed. I mean, I really enjoyed this multi-lingual multi business that went on. It was sort of, um, it was quite funny sometimes. You know, it was sort of, um, it was good because everybody, there was an incredible degree of commitment by everybody, you know, mm. whether they were, you know, coming Iranian or, you know, French or whatever. There was a commitment. Everybody was on it, and I was so grateful for that. It made all the difference. It was extraordinary. It was really extraordinary. Everybody went to however many lengths it had to go to to get something done. Everybody coming with, up with ideas all the time. So it was a real collaborative effort, which which is which I loved, which was great. And it wasn't me sitting up here going, "This is the way it has to happen." Mm. That's so beautiful. <laughs> it's great. Uh, yeah, and I think it's you know I I I think it's reflected that the both from the production side and within the film, there's a sort of collective spirit that that is really okay. primary. And in the film, um, individually, we experience characters' lives, mm -hmm. um, you know, these fragments of people living their lives in a way, like you, you gave that beautiful metaphor of the broken mirror. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, taken together, we're witnessing this larger story of a neighborhood and of the city and of a, of a country. Um, and so I'm wondering how you approach the script in such a way that it could both portray the individual struggle and the collective experience um, that you were so um, determined to to make. Yeah. Um, well, I, I I I concentrated initially on the individuals. I mean, who are the characters and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And and I think actually putting together the structure of the film was helped by uh, the fact that I'm a film editor mm -hmm. as well. And um, so you were continually having to, I realized what we were going to be doing was, you know, moving for the, from this scene here that we we're having to another scene over there, mm. which had nothing to do with it. But at some point we would return to this scene and the threads of this story would be picked up kind of thing. That was the idea. It was that sort of, um, it was that sort of structure. And, and every one of the, um, individual stories have a trajectory something changes 
with all the seriousness in the film, um, it also carries us through moments of tenderness and laughter and lightness. And so I was hoping you could tell us about your choices to include humor in the film. Well, to me, um, partly it's it's what I saw. I mean, you know, Iraq became something of a joke factory during that time. I mean, I was amazed. People would call me up and say, oh, I've got a new one. Here's this one. You know, and they would tell you a joke and you'd think, how are, pe how are people doing this in the middle of everything? But I realized that actually it's a form of resistance. Mm -hmm. It's a form of resistance and uh, it sort of belittles in a way the horrible things that are happening. Um, and I think it happens in many, it's like happened on the bus. I mean, that scene on the bus, which turns into humor, that actually, that's a real scene. I mean, that actually really happened. That was the dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, because that's, it's a way of survival. Because actually, if you don't make jokes and you don't laugh, and you don't sing. Um, what what are you left with? Just despair, really. Um, and I think I think it's a sort of it's a sort of courage that that, that people find inside themselves to just um, resist. I w I will not be, um, you know, damaged by this. So resist the damage that's all around them. That's what it felt very much like to me. Um, and in some cases, and actually in the history of Iraq, I mean, where there has been a lot of violence and, you know, civilizations have risen and have fallen into dust and so forth. I mean, there is a kind of resilience that the ha people have, throughout all that, people are making things. You know, they're writing poems, they're making uh, pictures, they're making mm -hmm. and so forth. And that, and that, you feel that very much there when you're there. People aren't sort of sitting around thinking, oh, what do we do now? We just do it. Sort of. So that's that's why. I mean, I thought it was it was really important to have the humor because actually it was there. You know. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the well, the images in the title, our river and our sky, and the importance of the river in Iraq, um, the two rivers uh, and the imagery of it and connections to it. And it's sort of um, as a as a force of a life-giving force and also, you know, with flooding and um, now the withdrawal of the river level with climate change, I mean, mm -hmm. it um, exposes the vulnerabilities also of living, um, living with, with the river. And um, in your care, in your in your cast, there's one character who's sort of the silent presence, and who is the river, the river boat man, and he's um, he's there as a kind of timekeeper and a protector of the city, um, and vulnerable as well to its elements. And I'm wondering what you see as the significance of that character and the river as well in the storytelling that you were doing about about this moment and this place and these people? Yeah. Well, I think the river became, for, for, for me, the river is really important, just me personally, because my grandparents' house was on the river. Mm. And, um, you know, my uncle had a little motorboat and would go up and down the river. And I've never lived in a place without a river in it. And I don't think I would. I mean, <laughs> the city needs to have a river in it for me. And um, so it was all, always a sort of... Um, a touch point um, for me uh, when I went back to the river. I felt, you know, in the right place, and I think it's very important. It's 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 part of Baghdad's identity. I mean, people feel um, a lot. You know, the river. They spend a lot of time on the river, on the river banks, and on the bridges, and um, it's very important to people. And at that time, it was a place of refuge. I think because I mean. The bombings and all of that were not happening on the river. They were happening where people, you know, within a lot of people, you know, in the city and the and sort of. Um, and my backstory for this character, and this character came out of the blue. I don't know, you know, he just he was just <laughs> there one day, and what I thought of was his backstory was he lived in a in a an area that was very violent. There was a lot of violence. And so he was stepping up on the courses and everything every day. And he, and these images began to invade his his sleep. And he was, you know, he was having nightmares all the time with people, you know, an eye, an eyeball hanging from a socket and all that sort of really horrible graphic stuff. 
So, but he was, he worked on the river. And so finally he decided that he would leave. He would leave. He didn't want to see any of that anymore. He just couldn't take it. And he would mm. come to the river and he would just ferry people back and forth to the river. Except that he finds a body in the river. And which, which happened at that time, you know, and it's a sort of really distressing moment for him, but he deals with it and that's it. And he's, he's like, for me, he's like a sort of, he's the witness and he's the spirit of Baghdad, if you like, mm -hmm. as the river is. Yeah. And the actor who plays him, Ali, Ali Karim, he's, um, he lives in, he's the one of the ones who lived in Berlin. And I was um, doing some auditions with other Iraqi actors who were in Berlin. And I did a bit with him. And he has this incredible kind of stillness. He's very warm, but he has a, a real stillness inside him. And I thought, this is him. So the film leaves me um, with like this unsettling question of what I would do if I were in Sara's situation. You know, would I leave? Would I stay? Um, and... I'm wondering if you could talk about um, how you consider the different possibilities of portraying this impossible decision and its consequences um, for a character. And I... Well, um, it, I mean, it, it's, it's good that it's disturbing. I mean, it's sort of, it's, it's really, I mean, if people are going, I mean, somebody else who saw the film said to me, I found myself asking me, what would I do in a situation like this? You know, not only with Sarah, but other different people, would I would I um, hide somebody who would be dangerous and endanger my life with that? Would I do it? I don't know, you know? And that's that's really also what I wanted, that, that actually that I, I wanted the, the characters to be real to people. Um, and to to feel like, oh, I you know, I'm a woman. I have a daughter that age. And if I were living in this situation, what would I what would I do? And like, quite a few people have said that to me, and I I'm really grateful for that because that's the point. Because actually, in in war zones like uh, Iraq wars and everything, if people are if there's empathy with them and stuff, they're portrayed as victims. You know, and it's a kind of abstraction. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't get the real person and you don't get to put yourself in their shoes which I think mm -hmm. is wrong so um, I knew she had to let her brother go and that was going to be painful because he just he was clearly going to go I I really couldn't think of another way of doing it I just thought that had to be that kind of moment where she says to him I'm not you know, I, I can't leave and that and that business of um, you know, it's our it's our river, it's our sky, it's our earth. Um, I've heard I've heard lots of people say that. Mm. People who are, I mean, I've in, in, in one of the films that I made about uh, Iraqi women who are in exile here. I remember somebody saying to me, "Well, it's not my sky, it's not my earth, it's not." So I feel a bit, I feel dislocated here. Mm. And, uh, it stuck with me. I mean, this was years ago, and. Um, and also, I mean, like, I mean, like, Irada has very much this this thing. She won't leave Iraq. I mean, she likes traveling, you know, to see Paris or to go to Berlin, or whatever. But she won't um, simply go and live someplace else. She doesn't want to, despite everything. Because I think she, like, like my friend in Gaza, who said exactly the same thing. It's like, it's very difficult here, but it's, uh, but here. I, if I do when I do something, I can make a difference. Mm. If I go someplace else, okay, I'm safe, but um, I don't. I can't. I, I probably won't make a difference to what happens there. But here, it might. And also, there's the idea of if you leaving, who are you leaving the country to? You know, these people who are killing everybody, or what? You know, the American occupation. You know. yeah. So it was a final, final question. A kind of frank question. Um, you're obviously very committed to storytelling about Iraq, Iraqis specifically. <laughs> and I'm wondering what the stakes are for you in making films about Iraq today, given the broader context of um, what the world sees and, and knows um, 
of Iraqis' experiences, and specifically when you're making films as as someone with Iraqi origin who doesn't live inside the country. Um, well, it's a it's a tricky situation. To, it's a tricky situation to be in. I mean, it's it's. Um, I had to make this film. I just I had to. Um, and when I showed it in Baghdad, it was interesting because people people liked it. But there was a young man who raised his hand. And he said, uh, "Were you here in 2006?" And mm -hmm. I said, "No, I wasn't here in 2006. And actually, I've only lived about five years of my life, my whole life, this country." And I said, "Why did you ask that question?" He said, "Because those of us who've actually lived through it, we would probably make a different kind of film." I said, in, I'm, "I'm sure you would." And the fact that you're uh, a man, and I, you know, we might make different films also. You know? mm -hmm. But um, so, you know, I, I, I am that person that is a stranger everywhere I go. So it's a sort of, it's a very, um, it's tricky. I mean, I can't, I can't pretend to speak for Iraqis or anything like that. Um, but I have, I mean, I have this access to and, and concern with that part of the world um, because it's part of my roots and um and that you know that came after the 91 to war um where you know it just looked like the place was being eradicated and there were no people um that all this firepower was falling on you never saw that in the media you never saw a person speak and that's when i decided that you know i was in a position to be able to to do that and to talk about what's going to iraq to these people over on this side of the bridge that I'm standing on. Um, so that's what I've, you know, that's what I've done. But it's, um, it is a, tr it's a tricky position. It is a tricky position. Um, especially because I didn't really live there for a great deal of time when I was younger. You know? um, and, but also, it doesn't mean that I'll just continue making films about Iraq. Mm -hmm. but, Maybe I do something else. <laughs> exactly. Of course, I'm thinking of another film, and it is about Iraq. I have to say, but it's sort of. But who knows? You know, who knows if it'll actually happen? Actually will it be a narrative happen. film, or will you return to documentary? No narrative. No narrative. <laughs> so um, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. It's very early days now, and I can't. And all this kind of follow up with the, with this film, this present film. Uh, lens that I haven't really had a chance to sit down and, and write anything substantial yet. But the characters are coming. <laughs> it all begins with the characters. <laughs> yeah, it, does. it does. Well, I'm really looking forward to whatever um, you're doing next. And I want to I wanna thank you so much for joining us and for your beautiful film. Um, thank you. Thank you. Well, that's great to be here with you such a different picture of Iraq than what we what we see and yeah. uh, thank you